The world's greatest psychologists could not distinguish gay people from straight people based on personality tests. So all these claims that there was something wrong with this were just wrong. It took a while for that to penetrate, but not all that long, really. It took a bit over 10 years, maybe 15. That's how you do it. You do it with the evidence and by winning the argument. You cannot win minds by silencing people. That, I think, is, is the fatal flaw in the argument for canceling. Hello out there, everybody. This is Glenn Lowry, host of The Glenn Show. Thanks for tuning in. Every other week, I have a conversation with John, John McWhorter of Columbia University. Uh, but this week, which is scheduled to be a Glenn and John week, we're going to have to mix things up a little bit. Unfortunately, John is under the weather. I predict that we'll be back on schedule next week for Glenn and John. But this week, I'm offering you my interview with Jonathan Rausch of the Brookings Institution, author of the book, The Constitution of Knowledge. <clears throat> so please do enjoy this conversation with John Rausch and look forward to encountering Glenn and John in our uh, dynamic duo next week. Thank you. Thanks for tuning into The Glenn Show. Hi there, this is Glenn Lowry. You've tuned into The Glenn Show. Uh, I'm with Jonathan Rausch, who's a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. Uh, and uh, we're going to be talking about his book, The Constitution of Knowledge, and about related matters. So welcome, Jonathan. Nice to be here. Real pleasure. Yeah, uh, I should mention that The Glenn Show is sponsored by the Manhattan Institute for Policy Research in New York City, where I'm John Paulson, senior fellow. Uh, that we're on every week, every other week with John McWhorter of Columbia University. But this week I'm with Jonathan. So, Jonathan, um, how's the book coming along? It's uh, almost two years old now, right? Yeah, it'll be two years old in June. It's it's done well. To my great surprise, it's the best-selling book I've ever written, which it's also the most dense and philosophical. So maybe that says something good about where our society is. I recall seeing you at the event here at Brown University that John Tomasi, my former colleague in the political science department, had organized. And uh, you were holding forth very philosophically, Plato and all of that kind of stuff. I, I, I do practice philosophy without a license. My highest degree is a, is a bachelor's of arts. So I'm here on a false pretense. You've been at Brookings for a while, have you? Yeah, physically since 1996 and on the staff as a, as a scholar since 2011. But uh, I've been doing epistemology since my book Kindly Inquisitors came out in, my goodness, 30 years ago. It's called Kindly Inquisitors, The New Attacks on Free Thought. And people now say it was prescient, um, you know, on cancel culture and, and academic suppression um, and enforcement of orthodoxy and, and all of that. And all I can say is that these are not new trends. We saw these coming miles and miles away. Okay. So one observation here, devilish, might be the people who are most worried about being canceled are worried because they're saying stupid stuff and they're saying evil stuff. And the weaponization of the free speech debate, I can hear my colleague who will remain nameless, but I've got more than one of them up here at Brown, is really a political move. It's a move to try to, uh, to, to, try to uh, control uh, uh, what's being said. It, it doesn't wear its colors right up honestly and in front. It's procedural but it's really about substance. Um, what do you think about that kind of argument? I mean, am I clear? Am I clear? As, yeah, yeah, as to what I hear it all the time. I'll, I'll restate it a bit, but the version of it I hear is that free speech is cover for privileged people, especially privileged white male people like me, to, uh, to say what they want to say without being held accountable. And now you've got a world in which minorities and the formerly powerless are capable of holding them accountable. And that's what's happening. And they're complaining about it and calling it canceling and, and well, tough luck. Um, so, yeah, I, I hear that all the time. Um, 
And there's so much wrong with that that it's hard to know where to start. But but I'll hit you with a few things. Um, number one is that free speech has been the weapon of choice for oppressed minorities since the beginning of time. And I know something about that because I'm a homosexual American born in 1960 when we were considered mentally ill by the psychiatric profession and considered deviant and a threat to national security by the government and called sinners from the pulpits. We had no money, we had no votes, we had no power, we had no representation, we just had our voices. And that's what we used. And we confronted the haters again and again, and that's how we won. It's, you know, don't take my word for it. Frederick Douglass said every shackle of slavery in the South would be broken in five years if we had free speech, which the South forbade. John Lewis said that without freedom of speech and the right to dissent, the civil rights movement would have been a bird without wings. So the premise is wrong. Minorities desperately need freedom of thought and speech. It's our only real ally, actually. And then the second thing that's wrong is that so-called canceling, um, maybe a term like social coercion would be better, um, that this is just a form of accountability. Accountable is, is the last thing it is because you know it doesn't really matter whether what you wrote or said that people decide to go after you for is actually true, is actually harmful, um, is, is actually in some way evil. And most of the time it's not. In fact, most of the time they don't even read what you write. The point is to make you fearful and make other people who see your example fearful. The point is not to criticize the idea the point is to silence and marginalize the individual. So what this really is, is a way for small minorities to control conversations on a much larger scale than the quality of their ideas would normally allow them to do. And that is fundamentally against what I call preview of coming attractions, the constitution of knowledge. You know, James Scott, the uh, political anthropologist at Yale, the weapons of the weak. You, you, you know who I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, I do. Uh, so what about the argument that shutting down Ray Kelly when he comes to speak at Brown University, this is, I think the year is 2013, might be 2012. But in any case, this is the police commissioner of New York City. He's a stop and frisk advocate and practitioner. The students and some of the radical townspeople in Providence, Rhode Island, Brown University, where I live and teach, think, no justice, no peace, no racist police. This stop and frisk advocate is going to come up here and tell us about policing when he's really trying to justify white supremacist domination of black bodies on the streets of Manhattan. What's wrong with shutting him down? That's a weapon of the weak in James Scott's uh, uh, terminology. That's a way of us exerting what little bit of power and influence we can over this conversation. After all, he's for stop and frisk policing. Well, you know more about stop and frisk policing than I do, um, but I know a little bit about weapons of the week. And the first assumption that is wrong is that shutting down speakers actually works. What you really do is you draw more attention, not less, to what it is they have to say. You know, people don't know this, but the Weimar Republic had extensive hate crimes laws and prosecuted Adolf Hitler. Under them, and this was one of Hitler's most successful tactics. Nazis put up posters all over Germany saying, "What is it that the authorities, that Herr Hitler is saying that the authorities don't want you to hear?" So, a good way to draw attention to a speaker, whether it's I don't know the who's the person you just mentioned, Ray Kelly, or I don't Ray know, Kelly, ben, Police Commissioner New York oh, yeah, City, yeah, so Ray 19, Kelly, twenty twenty. Or for that matter, you know, Mike, Mike Pence or Ben Shapiro, whoever it is that someone thinks is outrageous, the best way to draw attention to them is to go on one of these campaigns to deplatform them. It would be assuming that, that, that this person was right, that Ray Kelly is someone who should not be listened to. The best way to accomplish that is nobody should show up. You know, if, if, if Ben Shapiro were greeted by crickets or Milo Yiannopoulos were greeted by crickets in the hall, their speaking fees would drop and they'd go away. So that's the first thing. It doesn't work. But the second point is, is more fundamental. You know, it goes to what, what John Stuart Mill said famously in On Liberty, which is that the man who knows only his own side of the argument does not even really know that. 
we I was an advocate for for years, starting in the mid '90s for same sex marriage. Everyone was against it. Democrats were against it. Republicans were against it. We had no friends at that point in that movement. What we were able to do, because we were not in a position to shut down people who disagreed with us, is come to understand their arguments and the weaknesses in their arguments, which meant that when we confronted them, and boy, did we, we were able to shred their arguments. I was able to state their arguments better than they could and then demolish them piece by piece. And if somehow they had not been allowed to make those arguments and I had not had to hear them and strengthen my own case, I don't think we would have won. Well, I have a lot of sympathy for that. But what about the N-word? What about the Confederate flag? And ultimately, what about Donald J. Trump? I mean, what about racism? What about blackface? That's a kind of speech. Uh, surely, there are um, a, a, a decent drapery that applies to how it is we express ourselves in public, where we give deference to the sensibilities of the marginal, and where we recognize that history has taught us certain lessons, and they need to be reaffirmed. Depends where you're drawing the line. If you're saying we should try to be polite and kind to each other, and then when we approach someone in a critical conversation, that we should try to do that respectfully and focus on the argument and not the person, I completely agree. Um, there are people who are crazy, obnoxious, stupid, and evil. Usually the best thing to do about them is ignore them and let them drift off into their own little universe. Um, if shutting them down worked, then maybe I, I guess I'd consider it, but we need to know where the racists are, right? In order to be able to confront them. Hate speech is a problem, not because it's speech, but because of the hate that lies behind it. And hatred comes from fear and ignorance. Most people don't get up in the morning. Some do, but most don't get up in the morning say, who, say, who can I hate on today? They were afraid of homosexuals because they believed that we were going to bring God's judgment down on America, subvert the U.S. government, and seduce and convert their children. And what we had to do is confront those ideas. And yes, yeah, sometimes they were very rudely expressed. But sometimes those ideas were very politely expressed, yet were just as harmful, just as inimical. And what I tell people is that suppressing those comments, suppressing that speech, is like dealing with global warming by breaking all the thermometers. It goes after the symptom. It does nothing about the cause. In fact, it makes the cause worse because when groups of activists begin using their political power to decide what the rest of us can say, the rest of us get unhappy about that and vote for, you named him first, Donald J. Trump. Okay, let's talk that about the Constitution. Sense? Yeah, no, it makes a whole lot of sense to me. I can't tell if you're straw manning here or actually if you're devil's advocating or <laughs> good. That means I'm doing my job. Well, that's that is good. Uh, no. Yeah. You, you I need mean, to I'm, holler I'm, at me I'm, when I'm, you see when you see chinks in my armor. I want to know if you think uh you think I'm missing something. I'm watching, something. I'm looking. I teach a course here um called the Free Inquiry in the Modern World, and we start with Plato's um Apology of Socrates and uh, Allegory of the Cave. And we read John Milton's uh, Areopagitica, um, you know, licensing books in uh, 17th century Britain. And we read John Stuart Mill. We read him very carefully, very well. We read uh, uh, George Orwell, Politics in the English Language. We read Vaclav Havel, uh, you know, The Power of the Powerless, you know, the dissidents in Eastern Europe. Uh, anyway, Alan Bloom, the closing of the American mind. So, you know, and next time I teach it, the constitution of knowledge will be on the reading list. So I'm a fellow traveler. I really am. I'm a UATX, University of Austin, Texas, uh, advisor and uh, heterodox academy, um, you know, member and everything like that. I'm, I'm a fellow traveler. 
So what do you say when uh, you're hit with this argument that minorities are hurt by free speech? Uh, I say that, uh, I mean, I, I have a hard time talking about this in the abstract, just uncoupled from the actual substance of the thing. So let me be concrete. Charles Murray and Richard Herrnstein write a book. They publish it in 1994. It's called The Bell Curve. In it, they argue a lot of things, that IQ is important, that it's largely under genetic control, that it differs substantially between racial groups, and that some part of that difference is heritable. It's a part of what's going on biologically. They're agnostic about whether it's 30% or 60%, but some part. Uh, test case, really a test case. Uh, I'm black. Am I genetic? Are my people genetically inferior? That's a, I mean, that's more than an, an insult. I mean, that's an affront to the very uh, dignity and integrity of my person. That 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 it, that's an effort to direct the public conversation in such a manner that I would be characterized as somehow less than fully human. So I object. On the other hand, I'm a social scientist, and I think, well, you know, there are questions of objective fact here uh, about, well, what is intelligence? How do you measure it? How does it vary in human populations? To what extent is it under what kind of influence? How important is environment? And so on. You can't wish the answers to those questions. You have to learn the answers to those questions. I'm deeply invested in the intellectual political, civilizational framework that allows me to ask and answer questions of that kind, even questions that cut so close to the bone. So where I would come out is, uh, I don't necessarily agree with Mary's answer to that question. Let's parse it. It's a long, complicated, interesting conversation. But he gets to ask. The Southern Poverty Law Center doesn't get to shut him up by calling him a white supremacist because he asked the question. The, the currency of the realm is data and argument. And what if someone if you disagree says to you, with well, him, you have to refute him. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I'm... I'm no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm basically like, saying the same thing. I'm, I'm agreeing yeah. with you that... Well, I'm... Th this is going to help me because I sometimes feel that, that I have trouble stating these arguments in a, in a way that's emotionally binding. Um... And, and what if someone says to you, well, that's fine, Dr. Lowry, but what possible social good could be served by dragging everyone through a conversation about whether blacks as a race are intellectually inferior, given the history of that proposition in America? What good could possibly come of that? What do you say? I say, if the question were, should the National Science Foundation appropriate 10% of its budget to fund studies of this kind, then your concern is relevant. That is, you can ask and I can agree. We, we shouldn't make this a priority of our research fund. But if the question is whether or not Charles Murray sitting in his study gets to ask this question and pursue it uh, out of his own uh, interest, then uh, that utilitarian calculation, which is speculative, by the way, the calculation about what good could possibly come. How can we know? We don't know what we don't know. Maybe if we identified the deepest root of intellectual variation and intellectual performance in human populations, we would discover interventions like these eyeglasses I'm wearing that improve my vision. Uh, but we don't know enough about the underlying structural phenomenon to be able to even contemplate whether or not such would be the case. So the guy, this is, isn't this John Stuart Mill too? You're, you, you would be presuming yourself omniscient to declare in advance of the inquiry what, what possible good could the uh, product of the inquiry uh, uh, provide. Well, but we do right. have to make priorities in our practical judgments about what we do and we do not allocate our resources to. And in there, I would, I would weigh the consideration that you raise as more more relevant, something like that. Sure. Well, that, that all seems right. There are two points we, we touched on that are, are relevant here. One is that the, the bell curve, which, by the way, I did not read, um, 
is like what 500 pages long and and very yeah. dense that With book would have sold and footnotes yeah that book would have sold what 15,000 copies if Murray and Herstein were lucky if not for the fact that it became the center of a major controversy and so hundreds of thousands of people thought they had to go buy and see for themselves so the effect of turning that whole book which had a lot of stuff in it in one chapter I believe about race that's correct the effect of focusing on that one chapter and demonizing it and saying you can't say this was exactly the opposite of what the people wanted to do second is so Murray I was at Middlebury College. I guess it was 2017 speaking. And I, it turned out that I got there a few weeks after the famous incident where Charles Murray was there to speak, not about the bell curve. He's yeah. become a major conservative advocate of reducing inequality, guaranteed annual income, stuff like that. Um, yeah. And that's what he was there to speak about. But he was not only shouted down, but the faculty member who was there to escort him and and lead the dialogue with him on stage and push back so that he wasn't just flying solo that was allison stanger political scientist yeah they were attacked outside the building and she was seriously injured um and so you know what 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 breaks my heart most about this glenn is is that gay people in america we understand canceling it was invented on us right <laughs> if if but was actually maybe invented on you. But, but we had a version of it that's pretty similar to what happens today because the main enforcement for driving homosexuals into a life of secrecy, into the closet, was that we would lose our social connections and our jobs, our status, and often just have to leave town because of the sheer shame of it if it became known that we were homosexuals. That was the main thing we were fighting. I mean, there's also the psychiatric diagnosis and the military ban and the civil service ban and all of that. But the single biggest thing was this sense that, you know, all of our social resources, social coercion will be applied to make this group shut up because they are so evil. They are so beyond the pale. And what I thought we were fighting for in the gay rights movement, gay and lesbian rights, and now transgender and everything else, is not the right to silence other people in the way that they silenced us, not the right to drive them out of the public square, but the right to live, to let even wrongheaded people, people I think are wrongheaded and immoral, if they're not hurting me directly, if they're just saying things I disagree with, that's what I thought we were fighting for for all Americans, the ability to live according to your conscience. I have this little game I play. I go to colleges and talk about free speech, and I ask for a show of hands. I say, okay, here's the proposition. Homosexuality is objectively disordered. Is that hate speech? About half the hands will go up. I'll bet. And you know what that is? Does that yeah. ring a bell? That's the Catholic catechism right now. That is, that is what Pope Francis says. Um, and so what I'm, and I tell them, well, well, look, so, you know, are, are you going to say Catholics can't speak here? Are you going to say the Pope can't speak here? Cardinals and bishops? This is Orthodox Catholic doctrine. It's Orthodox evangelical doctrine. At some point, we got to decide to live with people we disagree with profoundly over moral issues. And we got to give up the idea that confronting these ideas that we disagree with make us weak and hurt. Um, that's condescending. I mean, gay people didn't back down in the face of these harmful ideas. We pushed back. You know, I hear you, man. I do. I really do. But I also hear my gay son, Glenn II, talking about how it costs lives, uh, how violence, you know, uh, how they deny my humanity. They, you know, I mean, I was once a better Christian than I am today. I was once an evangelical Bible believing Christian more so than I am today. And my son and I have had on more than one occasion, this confrontation, which I would say something like these, in this case, black evangelical American Christians who belong to the church that I would go to are good people who happen to be mistaken about this thing. This, you know, I'm, I'm in solidarity with my son. I love my son. He's gay. I accept him 
as a gay man, I mean, that's fine by me. I mean, that's who he is. But uh, he would say in response to that, they think I'm going to go to hell uh, because of who I love. And that attitude run rampant in society fosters uh, malicious acts of violence. There are people killing themselves because their parents won't accept them. There are people who are being bludgeoned to death because they carry themselves the way they do. And I know I'm not telling you anything you don't know. I'm just saying that's the answer that I'd get. I know the response I'd get. And frankly, I don't know what to say after that. That feels like a trump card to me. Well, I can tell you what I say, which is, of course, he's right. Harmful ideas, ignorance, bigotry have been causing, causing severe oppression and worse than oppression, death and misery down through human history. But if there's one thing we know, it's that for someone in political power, whatever their intentions to put themselves in charge of deciding what the rest of us can say or can, can believe is the most direct path to oppression and the most direct path to ignorance. Um, the idea that, for example, homosexuality was a mental illness, because of that, you probably know the story of Alan Turing. I do. Um, for any listeners who don't, Google it. Turing was arguably the second greatest hero of World War II after Winston Churchill. Codebreaker. Codebreaker, yeah. He broke the codes that defeated the Nazis. He was homosexual. When this was discovered, he was put through a regime that was called chemical castration, which is what it sounds like, and he killed himself. People were subjected to electrocardio, what is it, electroconvulsive therapy, sometimes even lobotomy. I grew up in that world. The American Psychiatric Association did not remove homosexuality from this statistical and diagnostic manual until 1973. I was 13. I knew that if I ever told people I was gay, you know, off to the funny farm with me, right? That's, that's the world I know. But you change that world by fighting the ideas, by proving they were wrong. It was a scientist, Evelyn Hooker, in the early 50s, started doing psychological research showing that, in fact, in blind tests, the world's greatest psychologists could not distinguish gay people from straight people based on personality tests. So all these claims that there was something wrong with this were just wrong. It took a while for that to penetrate, but not all that long, really. It took a bit over 10 years, maybe 15. That's how you do it. You do it with the evidence and by winning the argument. You cannot win minds by silencing people. That, I think, is, is the fatal flaw in the argument for canceling. Which means you would have been willing to accept the result if it had come out the other way. If it had come out the other way. But frankly, we always knew it was bullshit. Just saying, you know, between yeah. us. But yeah, truth okay. is truth. The Constitution of Liberty. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I love that mistake. That was Friedrich von Hayek. I don't know where that came from. <laughs> that's because um, that's because my book is it's I wanted that. I wanted to echo Hayek. It's a tribute. My title's a three way pun. Constitution of knowledge. It's constitution in the sense of U.S. Constitution. It's constitution in the sense of what makes up knowledge. And then it's an Easter egg for, for Friedrich von Hayek. James Madison figures prominently in the argument. He does. So, so here's, you want the elevator version of the book? Oh, yeah. Um, there's so much to dig into. I don't know where to begin. So the big idea of this book is that one of the hardest things for any society to do, maybe the hardest, is come to some kind of public agreement about truth. That's pretty easy to do if it's something, it's a life or death matter that's, it gives us immediate feedback. Like, is that a tiger in the woods or just the breeze? Or where is the next tribe camped? It is very hard to do with a more abstract question, like what is causing the ailment that is killing our children? Or why is it not rain for six months? And on those questions, we tend to come up with things like, well, it's that, that Glenn Lowry guy, he's, he's, he's a witch. That's why he's casting spells, kill him. Um, so the way most societies have dealt with this problem um, is to establish an authority, a fixed authority, it could be a text or an oracle or priests or Politburo or some combination, and say, this is what we're going to believe as a group. And if you don't believe it, you're going to get punished. And there's some problems with that. The first is it enshrines ignorance. It fixes it in place. 
is you can't question the belief, so you can't correct it. On top of the ignorance, you get authoritarianism, which is the people who are in control of truth control society. That's Orwell. And the third problem is it doesn't even work because then the society schism. Any deviation from the imposed orthodoxy becomes a threat to the solidarity of the group as a whole. And the society breaks apart and winds up going to wars. Uh, creed wars are very common down throughout history. One of the biggest was the famous wars of religion of the 16th century. And a guy comes along named John Locke and some other people who say enough of that. And they propose a radical different system, which is what if we put no one in particular in charge of deciding what is true? What if we set up a, a system, a network, where people are going to have to check each other and criticize each other? And you're going to do two things. The first is a rule that no one gets the final say. So everything is always open for question. That doesn't mean everything will always get debated because stupid stuff doesn't. And because, you know, we, we accumulate knowledge over time, so we don't have to go out every day and retest the boiling point of water. But in principle, no one's in a position, however certain they are, to say nothing more can be learned from debating this. I'm shutting it down. Second is the empirical rule. And it says, whatever I do to establish something is true, it needs to work for you and it needs to work for anyone else who tries it. No matter what language they're using, what country, what culture, that's what empiricism is. And that has the magical property of putting us all on the same page. So now we're all working, as many people as want to are working on this global process of this networked process of convincing each other, persuading each other with evidence and argument. And that, of course, is modern science, but not only hard science. That's everything that goes, in, goes on in academia. It's journalism. That is reality-based journalism. Um, it's law. The idea of a fact originates in the law, not in science, because before Galileo, courts needed accounts of the facts in order to make judgments. And that came from this adversarial process. Um, and it's government. Governments have to be reality-based. And that's why the U.S. government is absolutely shot through with institutions that are scientific and research-based. You know, the Census Bureau, Congressional Budget Office, the Inspectors General, and all the national institutes of science and so forth. What you get is this gigantic global network, and they're all obeying something I call the Constitution of Knowledge which is the rule book that we rely on as a society to come to collective decisions about what's fact and what's fiction. And it stems off these two rules that I talked about earlier, no final say and no, and no, no personal authority. But there's the basic idea is the same idea as the U.S. Constitution. In the U.S. Constitution, if you want to make law or policy, you're going to have to do it by working through a lot of compromises with a lot of other people with different points of view. And the notion there is you get a dynamic process that can ultimately bring society toward a consensus. Liberal science, as I call it, the whole enterprise of, of working through knowledge, basically does something similar. It says if you want to make knowledge, you can say anything you want, however stupid, however inane, that's fine. But if you want a legitimate claim to have made knowledge to add something to the textbooks so that Glenn Lowry thinks he needs to teach it in his course, you need to jump through a lot of hoops. You're going to have to frame your ideas in a certain way so that other people can, can access it. You're going to have to go through some arguments, some experimentation. You're going to have to show citations. Um, you're going to go through peer review. There's going to be criticism. It's at the other end of that process, that winnowing process that we reach the conclusion that what I had to say or what you had to say is true. That process, that's the constitution of knowledge. And it's a lot like the legislative process in a lot of ways. So this is the key concept that allows humans to do stuff like, for example, when a new virus comes along to decode the genome over a weekend, design a vaccine over another weekend, harness literally thousands and thousands of researchers and hundreds of hundreds of institutions around the globe to work on this problem, to shift resources, intellectual resources overnight. Um, the constitution of knowledge is literally, I believe, the greatest social technology ever invented because it allows for the production of knowledge at 
a previously unimaginable rate. We have we make no, more new knowledge as a species now every morning than we did probably in the first 200,000 years combined. So that's the constitution of knowledge. Okay. Um, Wasn't much of a nutshell. I'm sorry. I have some questions. I'm not sure I know exactly what the Constitution consists in. I mean, empiricism. I mean, a rejection of personal authority. Uh, the idea that evidence and argument. But beyond that, what's the sort of institutional embodiment of the Constitution? The reason I ask is because it's, it occurs to me that the science can be a kind of religious invocation as well, that, that people can defer to, quote unquote, the science. And then there can be a narrative about what the science says about climate change or about uh, focus protection and herd immunity or whatever. It can, the science can be politicized in a way that, and, and then I can get, you people who don't accept my reading of the question are anti-science, and I can reject their reasonable arguments like the Great Barrington Resolution because they're politically inconvenient to me. Uh, and I can wrap myself in the science, but I'm really making a kind of religious claim, not a scientific claim, et cetera. You, you, see, what I'm, you see what I'm getting at? Yeah, of course. So there's no easy glib answer to that. Unfortunately, the answer to that is that one of the things that the Constitution of Knowledge argues about is the boundaries of the Constitution of Knowledge and who's following the rules and who isn't and what the rules are and what they should be. Uh, similar, by the way, with the U.S. Constitution, we've got the written document, but everything else, including the meaning of those words, is contested. You know, just ask someone about the Dobbs decision. Yeah. The advantage of this system is when it works, when people are on the level, for instance, in an academic setting, when people are not behaving in a corrupt way, you can have that argument in a structured way. I mean, someone can go to Glenn Lowry or criticize Glenn Lowry publicly and say, you know, this, this article that he claims economics, it's just wish casting. But they're going to have to give reasons for that, right? They're going to have to show their work and you're going to be able to come back at them and you may not persuade them. You may be right. You may be wrong. Probably a third or fourth person out there is eventually going to come closer to the truth than either of you. But there will be a process for resolving those disputes in a way that is likely to be peaceful. It is not very common that, say, journalists or scientists resolve a dispute by burning someone at the stake or by destroying each other's books and lectures. They're going to have to go through this route of persuasion and public criticism, and that will entail sometimes some pretty hairy conversations about, well, okay, global climate change. Is it established? Is it not established? At what point do we say that? That's all fine if people in good faith try to follow the rules. Now, the problem is, as you know, because um, you've talked about it as much and as eloquently as anybody I know, there's all kinds of temptations to take shortcuts around the rules and all kinds of ways to do that. Like, I know the right answer. There's no point discussing it. Anyone who wants to discuss it is a bigot, a racist, a homophobe, etc. That's just one of the ways. There are lots of others to try to cheat on these rules. And so what this book is trying to push back on is the importance of of staying on the level, staying empirical, staying depoliticized. Now, individuals will be. You know, we're biased. We're political animals. Of course we are. The magic is in a system that forces us to expose our biases to the biases of others. Just as in the U.S. Constitution, Madison's great doctrine, what's the one force that can counteract political ambition? It's political ambition. You pit them against each other. You pit biases against other biases. They become a resource. And our errors become something that we can actually use to drive the conversation forward. We're hunting for each other's errors on a global scale. And yeah, no guarantees on any given day there are mistakes, there are problems, individuals are politicized. But over the medium and long term, it's fantastic. I gather that you don't much care for the metaphor, the marketplace of ideas. I, I actually love it, but it's it's 
inad- it's insufficient. It's necessary, but not sufficient. Um, the, the marketplace of ideas, you know, it goes back to a, a, a dissent in the case of U.S. versus Abrams by Oliver Wendell Holmes. And it says you're going to have a lot of ideas and they're going to be exposed to competition. And the best one will win, at least over the medium to long term. And I like that metaphor and I use it. But here's, here's what's missing. It just somehow assumes that magically out there the ideas will confront each other and, and have a contest and the best one will win. And what I came to see after I wrote my first book on this, in this field, Kindly Inquisitors, way back, is that I had left out the most important chunk, which is the one that, that you alluded to earlier, Glenn, and that's what are the institutions that we rely on to enforce these norms? You need rules. It cannot be the case, for example, that I could start my research paper in economics with the words, Glenn, you ignorant slut. That, for those who are too young to know, that's a famous sketch from Saturday Night Live, um, which alas came true in American media. You need lots of structures. It takes years of training to inculcate the norms of the Constitution, all the things you're going to have to do to become an economist all the ways you're going to have to talk, the vocabularies you'll have to master, building credibility with the people you need to persuade, understanding how to set a research agenda. And that's just at the individual level. At the group level, you've got the American Economics Association, you've got all the journals, you've got all the meetings that are working when they work together to try to create these norms that we call science, right? That's the magic ingredient. It can't just be individuals popping off all the time because that's Twitter. That's chaos. That's nihilism. You've got to have the structure. That's, I think, what Mill missed. It's what Popper missed. It's what I missed. Uh, It just kind of assumes that ideas will take care of themselves if you have free speech. You need more than that. You need, it's like politics. Madison comes along, the Articles of Confederation are failing. They're leading to chaos. They're just not strong enough. Madison and the others realize, no, you need a constitution. You need some rules. Unfortunately, got, they got those pretty close to right. Unfortunately, the Constitution of Knowledge is pretty close to right. I was just going to say the marketplace metaphor, of course, refers to buying and selling and the price getting set by supply and demand. Uh, and you, the speaker attempts to extend that to argument and ideas. But even in the uh, root case of supply and demand, you need institutions, you need property, you, you, you need security and property in order to be able to have trade. Yep. Corporations, like that. courts, all of that. So. And people forget about that too. Okay, let's talk about Donald Trump. Uh, do you regard him as a particularly uh, you know, insidious threat to the integrity of American democratic institutions? If so, why? If not, why not? The answer is yes. The reason is, I'll give a one-line answer and then try to back up and, and give it the necessary texture. Donald Trump has deployed, successfully deployed, and to some extent even normalized the application of Russian-style mass disinformation in American politics, something that no one has ever tried to do before. Maybe the pre-Civil War Confederate uh, separation, or separatists went down that road, but, but nothing like this. Um, and these are, these are very dangerous tactics. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Constitution of knowledge, it's complicated. It relies on a lot of good faith by a lot of good actors, and it relies on an information market. Um, of course, there's going to be a lot of garbage out there. There are going to be a lot of people believing weird and silly things, but it, it needs an information market. Um, that is not hopelessly polluted. One of the things that you can do to stymie it goes back to the days of the czars. The Russians are especially good at this. Is what's called a fire hose of falsehood propaganda campaign. And that's where you put out so many lies, exaggerations, half-truths, and conspiracy theories, salted with some actual truths at such a high volume through so many channels The people get so confused and disoriented that they begin to throw up their hands. They say, I don't even know what's true or false anymore. In fact, I don't even know if there's a difference between what's true and what's false. This is why Putin, when, for example, uh, when two Russian agents 
are sent to England to poison a Russian expatriate and are nailed for this. Putin and his gang put out not just one false explanation, they put out over a dozen, all mutually contradictory. You know, they weren't poisoned, it was an accident, it was a revenge killing, they never died, you, you name it. So Donald Trump comes along, and he is a student of disinformation. Disinformation is the real thing. It is the, the manipulation of the social and media environment um, to create uh, deception and disruption, domination, ultimately demoralization is what you're out to do. Make people so confused and so bewildered that they stay home, then you can dominate them politically. Donald Trump comes along during the course of the 2016 campaign, according to the Washington Post fact checkers, were pretty good. Um, 70, 70% of the checkable claims that he makes over the course of his campaign are mostly or entirely false. That compares to 25% for, for Hillary Clinton. Clinton's number is too high. Sure, we'd like it to be zero. We'd like it to be 1%. 70%, however, means that if the man's opening his mouth, what he's saying is probably false. You don't do that by accident, right? I mean, if, if Glenn Lowry wanted to go through life and 70% of the checkable statements he made were, how would you even do that? The first two things he does on Inauguration Day is publicly lie about the size of the crowd, an easily checkable fact just by looking at photographs, and publicly lie about whether it rained during his inauguration. It did. He claimed it didn't. Easily checkable. That's not deception, Glenn. No one is fooled by that. That's his saying from now on, there's no limits on what I can assert. I'm going to be the boss from now on on deciding what's true and what's false. And by the way, I could change my mind tomorrow. I can call it square today. I can call it round tomorrow. Then he publicly says, don't believe the evidence of your own senses. Believe what I tell you. Then over the course of his presidency, he is clocked by Washington Post fact-checking team at over 30,000 false statements. That's an average of 20 a day. Um, that number ticks up sharply. The rate of falsehoods ticks up sharply in April and May of 2020. So you ask yourself, hmm, what's happening in April and May of 2020? The answer is this is when he starts his Stop the Steal campaign by targeting mail-in voting as a source of fraud. Now, this seems weird to people like, you know, us nerds at Brookings because there's a pandemic on and old people tend to skew Republican. And if they can't vote by mail, that's bad for Republican turnout. What the heck is he doing? Well, it turns out he's doing several things. First, he's not targeting the election. He's targeting the day after the election. And he's doing that by number two. He is debuting and testing the narrative that he's going to use past the election, creating the networks of disinformation among politicians, conservative media, the grassroots that he's going to disseminate. He's putting all that in place so that sure enough, he knows he's likely to lose the election. Sure enough, the day after he begins unloading the Stop the Steal campaign, the false uh, claim that he won the election. This is by far, beyond any compare, the largest, most audacious, and most successful disinformation campaign that has ever been run against American democracy, all the more so because it's internally generated. So yeah, is that dangerous? Yes. It is by far the most dangerous thing he accomplished in his time in power. Okay, Sorry, I'm obliged, I feel to, I'm obliged to push back. No, yeah, it's all good. I, I don't relish it, but it's necessary. So he would have won that election, but for the COVID pandemic, he was headed toward winning that election. I don't understand why he needed a plan to reject the legitimacy of the election, uh, as such as you have laid out given that the advent of the pandemic couldn't have been anticipated by anybody. Uh, secondly, uh, was he lying about fake news when the retrospectives on the uh, Russia collusion hoax seemed to pretty much, you know, I'm looking at this recent Columbia Journalism Review piece by Girth, 
uh, nail the fact that the Washington Post and the New York Times really betrayed their obligations to journalistic integrity, integrity I assume that you would affirm, by going all in on the political program of uh, delegitimating uh, the outcome of that 2016 election, not the 2020 election, the 2016 election, which he won uh, by inventing and promoting this idea that he was in uh, collusion with uh, Putin and company to uh, to steal the election. So uh, he had every right to be out there going like this at his news conferences and talking about fake news and calling the press the enemy of the people because for at least that part of the electorate that voted for him, uh, they had a political program diametrically opposed to the to the interest of that uh, of his supporters and distorted the reality of uh, of his uh, relationship with uh, Putin and Russia in in their tendentious reporting. There, I've said it. So. The first of those is easy. I think he knew he probably would lose. He could read the polls. And he did lose. And that's why he set up an elaborate campaign to claim that he won if he lost. So that one's easy. The second one is I haven't read the CJ article. I heard about it for the first time yesterday. It's dead wrong. Collusion is well established. Not illegal conspiracy, which is a term of art. Collusion is not a term of art. Um, instead of dragging you through all that, I'll send you a link after the show to a piece I wrote about it. Um, I think it's open and shut. Of course, he colluded. He publicly asked the, the Russians to interfere in the election publicly twice. Russia, if conference. you're listening, if you're listening, Russia, if you're listening, <laughs> people forget this was at a press conference, not a rally. And a gobsmacked reporter said, are you serious? And he said, yeah, I'm serious. Why should I not be serious? And they did that the same day. His team met with Russians who came to him saying, we want to give you dirt on your opponent. He knew, his, his people, his son knew that they were agents of the Russian state. They took the meeting. What do you do if you're honest and you have Russians coming to you saying, we want to help you with the election? You call the FBI. Um, his campaign manager had a relationship with a known Russian intelligence officer and fed him internal campaign documents. There were That's over a hundred. Yeah, Paul Manafort. There were the Mueller report found over a hundred contacts between the Trump campaign and the Russians. So I could go on. If putting that together, welcoming a hostile foreign power's involvement in the election and doing everything in your power to help make it happen isn't collusion. What the F would be? But, okay, let's set that aside because none of it matters. Let's assume that the press were out to get him and that the whole Russian thing was a hoax, whatever you want to think. How does that justify running a mass disinformation campaign using every possible means of communication? The bully pulpit of the presidency, members of Congress and politicians, conservative media, grassroots, and even 62, I think, is the number of lawsuits, which were not designed to win. They were just designed to spread the lie. How does anything that the media did justify running that scale disinformation campaign claiming to have won an election that you lost, and even when that's refuted, Continue with it. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going on too long. No, no, it doesn't. And I want to be clear, and I'm, I'm on the record. I was wrong about Trump was what I called the post way back in January of 2021 when, you know, I could have been heard to say some things friendly to Trump. Not that I voted for him or anything, but that, you know, I thought he has supporters, they should be heard. Uh, but subverting the democratic uh, processes of the transition of power uh, on behalf of his own agendas was... Yeah. The pale. Yeah. Well, people say it didn't work. So no big deal. We move on. And I hope that's true. But I also but like I to point out to people that that his real legacy is going to be debuting successfully tactics of mass disinformation that have never been applied in the U.S. before. And we're going to see them again. This is not the end of it. That's ominous. I wonder how you'd react to this. OK, OK about Trump. OK. But you know what? He would have never gotten off of square one if the liberals and the censors, the censorious, sanctimonious, coastal elite liberals hadn't overplayed their hand and tried to force 
uh, an agenda uh, down the throats of whether it be about the border or it be about uh, you know the the culture war things or it be about race, et cetera, down the throats of uh, Americans until middle American union uh, member uh, working class white uh, you know whatever to shut the fuck up uh, and get in line. Uh, I think there's something to that. I wish that were not the case. But, you know, we've got these two movements that are going on. They're both using well-known established tactics of, of disinformation. Tocqueville you know, wrote about canceling. Um, but you've got the left using these social coerce, socially coercive tactics. Of if you open your mouth in ways that we don't like, we're going to claim that you're causing the, the moral equivalence of violence. Um, and we're going to turn you into a non-person if we can. Uh, we're going to have all your social contacts turn against you. We'll get you fired from your job um, and so forth. And then you get a lot of people who are very resentful about that. who now think, well, wait a minute. I, I can't say that there's only two human sexes, for example. I just, you know, there's a lot of other examples. I can't oppose affirmative action. I'm going to be like, I can't get a job in academia if I say those things. They're going to, you know tear off the first page of my resume when they see that and throw it in the trash. And, and they get, when Americans see that, they get feisty. This is why censorship, coercion tend not to work. And in this case, they looked for the person who was most out there with the most confrontational style and saying, boy, you can rely on me to tell these people to go shove it. So we get in this situation where you get this increasingly polarized country and you get factions on the left that are using social coercion to try to shut down argument and debate and pollute the information space and, and amplify their power far beyond the merits of their views. And you get this right wing group, which is MAGA, which is using Russian style disinformation, a different kind of tactic, but the same basic goal, which is to dominate the debate, kidnap your mind so that you're thinking about them all the time. Hitler famously said, it doesn't matter if they mock us or insult us as long as they can't stop thinking about us. And they do it that way. And both of these groups are able to dominate our public conversation. Ron DeSantis is running for president, isn't he? On the platform, Florida is where woke comes to die. Seems to be a quintessential illustration of the point that you're making right now. Well, you know, one of the things that's happening, I imagine that, that people in your life are, are affected by this, is we're now seeing state legislatures who have political power come in against what they call wokeness on the left with their own laws from the right that are specifically right. Um, banning certain points of view from instruction in state university programs. And that is truly scary stuff. Politicians are not experts. They don't know how science works. Um, they should not be waltzing in and saying, here's what you can and cannot study. Here's what you can and cannot think and say. That never ends well. We have, we have thousands of years of human history. You know, think Galileo to understand why that plan is not going to work. Yeah, but Glenn Youngkin won in that gubernatorial race in Virginia uh, saying that parents get to have a say in what their kids are being taught in school, which is not quite the same thing as politicians overriding experts on, on things. It's, it seems to me a perfectly legitimate point of view. I mean, uh, queer theory, I ain't saying it's right. I ain't saying it's wrong. I'm just saying it's not science. I think it's pretty wrong, actually. And well, that helps. as a member of the LGBTQ community, I, you know, that's a, that may be a somewhat controversial topic, but I'm going to go with wrong. I'm also going to say it should be tolerated. I don't think it should be legislated against. But I think you also need to give the public some assurance that academics are going to be on the level when they deal with it, that they won't assume that there's only one right conclusion and that anyone who disagrees with it is a bigot. There's a British academic. This didn't happen in the U.S. Her name, I think, is Kathleen Stock. She might have been on your show. She uh, was gender critical, meaning she, she had critical things to say about queer theory. Um, and she was not only hounded out of her job, but essentially her, uh, she had direct physical threats. Uh, she had to have protection. Um, she had to be removed physically from campus. Um, that should not be happening. 
Okay, it, we're getting toward the end here. I just want to ask, a, <laughs> having diagnosed a terrible problem, I'm wondering where you find any optimistic, you know, hope. Where What developments institutionally, politically, or otherwise do you look to to counteract this this trend that's undermining our democratic institutions, our ability to identify and come to mutual agreement about the truth? Well, there's a lot to say about that. So I'm going to try to be brief. And you just shut me down. But so I'm, I'm not necessarily an optimist and I'm not necessarily a pessimist, but I am very hopeful. And the reason for that is several fold. The first is that this is not the first threat to the constitution of knowledge, meaning our ability as a society to generate some rules to come to figure out truth in an orderly way. Um, we had, we had a big crisis uh, over 100 years ago in American media. The way we've gotten out of these things in the past, same goes for the printing press, which was the granddaddy of epistemic crises, crises about truth. The way we get out of them in the past is to strengthen and rebuild the institutions of the constitution of knowledge so that they can recover some of the trust that they may have lost and so they can do their job better. And we are, I believe, we're seeing progress on that front. It is much harder for example, for outside actors to run disinformation campaigns in American elections now because people know how to do it. Social media platforms, the mainstream media all are on the watch for it. They even have people who cover it. We've got places like uh, Stanford Internet Observatory, lots of other centers around the world that are actually getting inside the disinformation networks. We have new techniques that are being developed. One of the most successful is what's called um, pre-bunking. This is what the Biden administration did to Vladimir Putin a year ago with unprecedented success, a textbook operation where they revealed to the public what the disinformation campaign was going to look like and thus did two things. First, they provided some inoculation when they say, here's what you're going to see. It's going to be false. But second, they deterred Putin from even doing it. So pre-bunking is something that seems to work. Media literacy seems to work. We're seeing more of that. You know, this would mean so that more students would come to you with a better understanding of why you need to triangulate sources. We're seeing, I think, you know, social media has been more of a problem than a solution, but we're seeing efforts by those institutions to clean up their acts. That's a, that's a long, hard road. It's going to be really difficult. Uh, it's a challenge, but I'm I'm bullish on something like Facebook's oversight board, which is trying to set up some some rules of the road, uh, not unlike the rules of the road that turned American medicine in the 19th century from a bunch of wild people with um, with bogus bogus cures to a regularized profession that was able to evaluate evidence and have some uniformity. So there's tons of stuff going on. And I could continue. I think the biggest, most important thing that happened is that the disinformation merchants in the 2022 midterms failed. These were the people who, if they got into office, were going to use those platforms to advance false narratives about the election next time and to actually interfere with the election. I'm talking about Carrie Lake, for instance, who lost narrowly, too narrowly, but lost her bid to be governor of Arizona. And that also shows me voters are starting to wise up. So the way this is going to work is an all of society response where individuals begin to buffer themselves against disinformation tactics, conspiracy theories. They get wise to it. More important, where individual institutions begin to buffer themselves. If you ask me the institution of what I call the reality based community that I'm most worried about, it's yours. It's academia. That is where I think we're seeing the biggest problem of the incursion of politics into what should be um, level scientific and academic pursuits. I think it's a place where we see the biggest problem of mono, what's it called? Mono theory, mono cosmic. When you have everyone agreeing with each other, when you have entire departments and even disciplines, where you can go through your entire career and never encounter a Republican or conservative, that means your biases will go unchecked, which means you will not be doing the best science that you could do, and you will lose the confidence of a public which wants to see that you're open to multiple views. Um, so I think academia has the most work to do in terms of protecting freedom of speech, number one. Number two, protecting the integrity of fact. That means I'll follow where the research leads, even if it's unpopular, um, even if someone's not going to like it. 
And number three, diversity of viewpoint. You, you can't have the advanced knowledge, you can't have science broadly defined without disagreement. That's the engine of the whole thing. I can't see my biases. You can't see your biases. I can see yours, though, at least some of them. You can see some of mine. So you've got to have that diversity. And to the extent that's lacking in academia, to the extent we, in fact, see documented large-scale discrimination against conservatives in, for example, hiring in academia, in grant making, peer review, that's a very serious problem. And it's right at the heart of the constitution of knowledge. I appreciate that we're closing on a, a kind of bipartisan in the sense that the problem exists on the left as well as on the right note. I, I wonder whether you think that Jim Crow 2.0 uh, and that kind of talk, Stacey Abrams campaign, and that kind of talk isn't also the, the kind of talk being the election is illegitimate by, because, and then there's a claim about the motives of my partisan opponents and uh, passing uh, laws uh, regulating uh, the uh, mechanical procedures of voting uh, about the uh, racial exclusionary motivations of those people when you might say in the case of Georgia in the 2022 election, the, the data suggests that uh, access to the ballot was not a problem for black voters in Georgia. Uh, yeah, I agree with that. Um, you know, this this business of questioning the fairness of elections when you don't really have a case is is hardly new. Um, and I'm not a fan of it wherever yeah. it appears. I would just point out that, you know, when Barbara Boxer in the Senate did it in 2004, she was basically one person. And the um, and, and John Kerry had already conceded the race. So it didn't really matter. I don't like what Stacey Abrams did, uh, but it wasn't going to work. And it was mostly just her. What Trump and the MAGA movement have done, it's like comparing a house cat with a Bengal tiger. They've got so many more, uh, so much more political lift um, that you, you can't even begin to compare. And they've convinced two thirds of Republicans the election was stolen. Uh, Stacey Abrams could not have done that. Fair enough, fair enough. Well, okay. Am I wrong about, Glenn, am I wrong about academia? Am I too, am I too hard on them? No, I mean, <laughs> I've got so many friends and I can't name them. I can't name any of them because they're in the closet. I'm talking about professors of anthropology who have been teaching for 35 years, who have observed their discipline, professors of sociology. I'm talking about scientists. I'm talking, I, I, I met with one of my unnamed colleagues who's a biologist around here recently who was complaining about fear that uh, he'd be canceled if he, you know, uh, did the kind of stuff that he wants to do in biology. And it's, it's everywhere and it's a problem. It's a very deep problem. And the, I don't know, the constitution of knowledge in this particular realm doesn't seem to be working properly. It's, it's framed. The incentives framed. for administrators and leaders, you know, everything seems to be screwed up. Would you go into academia if you were starting today? Yeah, probably just because I love sitting on my butt reading books. <laughs> but I go, I do so with a great deal more trepidation than I did, gosh, 40 years ago when I, when I started out. Well, one of the reasons I think your voice is important, John Tomasi at Heterodox Academy and, and John Haidt and, and University of Austin people that we're both working with, one, one reason all that is so important is is somehow we have to get it through to academics, especially, but not only on the progressive side, that, that if they politicize the professions, they will not have the public standing to stand up against the attacks from the right of MAGA. And those people will say and do anything. So, and, and they will also drive from academia a lot of the best people who they want to have as colleagues and they want to be challenged by. So it's especially important for academics to get involved in saving these institutions, I think, in a more vocal and outspoken way than they've been willing to do in the past. You're here. I'm with you on that and doing the best I can. So thanks, Jonathan. Jonathan Rouse, Show Brookings Institution, The Constitution of Knowledge. Uh, I appreciate you coming on The Glenn Show. My honor.